They seek him here, they seek him there. They seek that strange old whale everywhere. James Whale, the voice of reason on the James Whale Radio Show. Hello, welcome. No, that was my tribute to the late David Frost. Uh, this is James Well, and welcome to your favourite radio station of choice. And if you're a radio station, big or small, and you want this show, get in touch, and we will uh, let you know what you need to do. James Whale Radio at gmail.com for anybody who would like to broadcast this programme who isn't able to at the moment. And hi to all of you listening to us uh, via our friends at talentgb.com. Now, a very busy programme this week. Uh, later, we'll be talking to Lord Archer. Uh, we're also going to be talking to uh, Mary Byrne, who uh, didn't win X Factor. Do you know, that's an interesting point. I didn't win X Factor either. Rob? Yes. I, Did you I, win X Factor? I didn't win X Factor, no. Good. Say hello to all the listener. Hello to all the listener. Yep, that's good. Uh, Rob produces this programme, and if there is anything, any minutiae, that you don't like, then just get in touch with Rob, because it is his fault. It's got nothing to do with me. I am purely the man who speaks the words. Every word that comes out of my mouth is written by Rob. Oh, dear. Yep. Very good. Now, before we do anything else, a letter came uh, rushing into the studios of the James Whale Radio Show this week uh, from Help for Heroes. And uh, I like, listen, I like to do anything I can for the guys uh, who serve our country. And Help for Heroes is uh, running a colossal cake store at the moment. And they said, Dear James, we wanted to drop you a line to let you know and your listeners about the annual Help for Heroes colossal cake store, which takes place from the 19th of April to the 5th of May this year. Last year, hundreds of cake sales took place across the UK, helping to raise thousands to support injured service personnel and their families. And we'd like to ask you to help spread the word about the Colossal Cake Sale. And if anybody wants to find out more, they can go to Colossic... Colossic? <laughs> Sorry, guys. Colossal Cake Sale, all one word. Colossalcakesale.org.uk And with 10,535 British men and women injured... In the recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan, I'll read that number to you again, 10,535 uh, British men and women injured in the recent conflicts in Iraq and Afghanistan. Combat stress, estimating that 40,000 servicemen and women will suffer from some form of invisible injury over the coming years. Let's do what we can do for the guys. Uh, and also... Uh, Robbo, what a shame you're not in the studio with me. Uh, they sent me a colossal cake. A colossal? What's a colossal? A, 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 I can't even say that. What's a colossal cake a, look a like? A colossal cake. Well, it's a, a cupcake, and uh, it's got the Help for Heroes logo on the top. And what they want is for people to make lots of cakes, invite their friends round, uh, sell cakes to their friends, send the money to Help for Heroes. But if you go on their website, colossalcakesale.org.uk, they will give you all the details. And so, uh, in honour of all those guys, I'll just eat the last bit of the cake. I was going to eat it through the show, but um, I put it in my mouth. Mm. Oh, dear. Mm. <laughs> it's very sticky. Mm. Very nice. And they sent this one... Mm. <clears throat> they sent this one... Um, this one uh, cupcake, and they sent it through the post. Which is very nice. And what I meant to do, and I can't do it now because I've eaten it, I meant to get a, a selfie of me and the cake and put it out on uh, on Facebook. But you'll put something out somewhere for us, won't you? I'll, I'll try. Yeah. Is there a crumb? You know, eating a cake. And just remember, colossal, C-O-L-O-S-S-A-L-C-A-K-E-S-A-L-E, all one word, dot org, dot UK. So, well done. Good. I was doing that. I thought I'd feel better now for doing that. I'm sure you do. Mm. So, Robbo, what's been going on this week? I hear you ask. Uh, what's been going on this week? Yes, I hear you ask. Well, all sorts of stuff. Uh, for instance, they are still 
discussing about decriminalising the TV licence fee for non-payment. Uh, what do you think will happen to the BBC? We asked this, actually, on Facebook and Twitter earlier on in the week, uh, and people text us as well. Um, BBC strategy director Mr Purnell uh, warned BBC channels could close if non-payment of the licence fee was decriminalised. Uh, and I wonder what you uh, thought about that. And uh, he did suggest, of course, that it might affect BBC Local Radio. Of course, BBC Local Radio, uh, some may say the unsung hero of the BBC. Lots of very enthusiastic and very loyal listeners uh, to BBC Local Radio. Uh, BBC Three, the television uh, service, is already going. And, of course, they haven't yet decided whether or not to decriminalise the licence. I wonder, what are your thoughts on that? Rob uh, Renshaw says uh, the BBC isn't the broadcasting giant that it used to be. If it fell by the wayside, so be it. Let the other stations pick up the bones of what's worth saving and resign what's left to history. Uh, Craig McKenzie says BBC should take on adverts. Uh, quite a lot of people think the BBC should take on adverts. Uh, Adam Law says they're already closing BBC Three. And they have uh, the licence fee. It's ridiculous. We have to pay in this day and age. And William Gates says, why not sell it to Noel Edmonds? <laughs> uh, blobby, b blobby BBC. No, I can't see that happening. Can you? Blobby, blobby, blobby. Blubby, blubby, blubby. Uh, Mark Powell says commercial TV and radio run very well with half the people. Uh, Nigel Nash says he'd be happy to lose the whole lot of the BBC. Uh, Stuart Thorpe, don't watch the BBC. Ed Wood Owen says get rid of party political broadcasts. Oh, well, listen, coming up later, Ed, uh, Jeffrey Archer, my guest, Lord Archer, we'll be talking to him. <laughs> I wonder what he'll have to say about that. Uh, some of your thoughts. I would only say this. Um, not because I occasionally work for the BBC, but I've always worked for the BBC over my uh, broadcasting time. You know, if I'm working for commercial, I'm working for then whatever. All I would say is this. I think that there needs to be a broadcasting organisation. It need not necessarily be as big as the BBC, and that will have to be decided. But I don't think every part of the media should be funded only by advertising. Uh, I think we need part of the media that isn't. But I'm sure you'll have some other ideas. And if you want to get in touch during the week, uh, you can Facebook us. You could tweet us with your thoughts. You could email us. Uh, text me 81888, of course, starting your text with the word whale. And text there will cost you 25p plus standard rates. Any views yourself, Rob? I mean, you've been very quiet. Or have you got a job with the BBC you don't want to say anything? I haven't got a job with the BBC yet. Um, but, no, but uh, you could have. I could have, yes. I'll, I'll be the one that gets the job, and then the week later it gets closed down. Hello? Uh, hello? <laughs> what? <laughs> what it all what are you saying hello for? Because <laughs> it all went off. What? It all went off? <laughs> it all went off. Is it back on now? It's back on now, yeah. What happened? Have you, have you paid the licence fee? <laughs> Obviously not. No, well, don't do that again, for goodness sake. Um, right. I... <laughs> uh, I tell you what, I think we uh, we ought to do a little commercial here, all right? Okay. Pay I think I'm going to do a commercial. Um, do you love films? Yes. Yeah, so do I. Uh, well, our friends at Love Film have said that they'll give anybody uh, who wants to ask, all you've got to do is ask, free films for a month. Do you fancy that? Yes, please. Okay. All you've got to do, go to the front page of our website, jameswellradio.co.uk. What is it? jameswellradio.co.uk Just wanted to check you're listening. And click on the Love Film banner. Now, just click on it. You've got to go through the stages and register. And when you register, you will get a month of free films. And if you enjoy what you've been watching, fabulous. If not, cancel it. So just go to jameswellradio.co.uk and click the link at the top of the page. It's dead simple. What is it? Dead simple. Dead simple. Uh, right. The, the Same-sex marriages start Saturday, and Rob and I are not getting married, but uh, it's another topic that people have been talking about this week, and uh, we'll have some of your thoughts on same-sex marriage. But I thought before we do anything else, let's have a bit of music from our next guest, uh, Mary Byrne, um, who... 
will be on the show right after this. Now, Mary Byrne uh, was in X Factor, but she didn't win. Why not? Name me last year's winner, Rob. Um, um, I rest my case. But there have been a lot of X Factor successes. Name one, Rob. One Direction. There we are. Probably the most successful band of all time. They're very Beatles-esque. They are. And Mary Byrne did not win X Factor. But she has got a great voice. And this is a track from her that's called Midnight Dreamer. They call me I sit by my window All my friends say I'm crazy Oh, the touch of your hand Oh, it may Midnight Dreamer from uh, Mary Byrne, and uh, let's talk to the lady herself, Mary Byrne. Mary, hi. Hi, how's it going? It's okay, but but more to the point, how's it going for you? Well, you know, look, at from the beginning of the show that I did to now, I've had a huge platform, and life has changed a lot for me, and it's changed in a good way. So it's gone great. Now, you didn't win, Mary, did you? No, I got to the semi-finals. I came fifth in the show. And, but that um, didn't mean you didn't get a career out of it. No, I got a great career out of it. For, I mean, at, at the age I am as well, I wasn't looking for a pop show. I wasn't looking to be a pop star. I was looking for recognition and the fact that I 
got to make an album and now have I'm on my third album, which is absolutely fantastic. Well, what sort of uh, thing went through your mind when you were asked if you would like to appear on there? Did you think? Did you think for a moment? Listen, this I, I, I'm perhaps a bit older than most. It might not actually go in my favour. They might try and make fun of me. Yes, I did. I actually did. Rem- I remember actually though say- what you just said there is what I felt. I mean, if I go on this and things go wrong, could I turn out to be the laughing stock? Or if things, if I go on there and things go right, I could actually turn out to have a good career. So thank God it went the other way. It went and gave me a good career. But yes, I was very nervous and I was very unsure of myself because at 50 years of age, I mean, you're finding your life, you're finding your steps in life, and you're finding out who you were. And to go on something like that and to be knocked down would have been a huge crush for me. But thank God it didn't happen. Because you used to suffer with depression, Mary, didn't you? I still do. I still do have depression. I, I'm on medication for depression. I get me days where I'm, you know, kind of low, but never as bad as I used to be. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm up there now and I know how to cope with them and how to handle it. it it's a, an ongoing thing and you're constantly working every day to, to beat the battle, to win the battle, I suppose. Hmm. Because it, if it had gone the other way, it might actually have made you even worse than, than you were. Well, do you know what? I thought about that as well. I don't think it could have because I had too much support from my family, my friends, and my daughter in particular. I had a lot of support from them, and they, their attitude to me was, no matter what happens, you are still you know, a wonderful person and you've got a great voice. And so I don't think I could have gone, could have really gone. Anyone that goes in there without support, yes, that can happen. But I think I had enough support to keep me going. Okay. Mary, you were, of course, on, on The X Factor. I was. But why do, you, why do you think it took The X Factor to give you this sort of recognition? Because you've got a great voice anyway. Thank you very much. I tell you, uh, um, as a young girl, I never had um, enough confidence in my voice. I never believed in what other people were hearing. And as the years went on, I did little charity shows. I did cabaret here. I did, a, you know, just getting up to sing on a karaoke. It... it it took me until I was in my late 40s to kind of realize that I, you know, I had, a, I had a talent and I needed to use it. So I went out and started using it with my brother, Tomo, and we started doing karaoke and tribute shows like Shirley Bassey and Tom Jones. And as I hit getting near my 50s and started the change of life, which is a lovely thing that women go through, um, <laughs> something just clicked inside me. And that's when I realized I deserved the chance like anybody else and took it with both hands. Did Simon Cowell show an interest in your career after X Factor or not? Yes, he did. Simon was... You see, a lot of people, you know, have this thing that Simon's just this cold-hearted man and, and says these horrible things on, on stage. And that's, that's his job. He's a businessman. But Simon had promised me an album. Simon came through with that album. And Simon gave me all the support I needed. I cannot say anything bad about Simon Cowell. He was wonderful to me. He is a kind man when he's not doing his business thing. When Simon is Simon, Simon is a nice bloke. And I really do mean that from the bottom of my heart. He does tell the truth, doesn't he? Yes, he has a habit of doing that, God bless him. <laughs> he, he was very good to me. And, you know, when he, was, when he was being truthful, I knew where he was coming from. The things I didn't like about Simon, I always said it to him, was that he kept changing his mind. One minute he'd tell you to, I should be singing a modern song, and the next minute he'd tell you to sing a, go back to what you were doing. So, <clears throat> I mean, that was him trying, his, trying it out to see which, which was best for me, I suppose, and which was best for the show. But he was always truthful. And do you, I mean, do you need to work in Tesco's anymore, Mary? Do you, uh, do you ever have times when you think, well, perhaps just uh, for a little bit of extra cash, I'll go back to Tesco? No, I haven't been in Tesco since I went on the X Factor. Um, Tesco's at this point in time are now coming, getting behind me for my new album, so I don't need to go back on the tail. But if I had to, it wouldn't take anything out of me because Tesco's were very good to me. Do you think that, that some, some people actually think of a music career as the only thing they'll be happy with and they're not prepared to do anything else? And sometimes when the music career doesn't work for them, they're left with nothing. I mean, you've, you've had a life before music. You've had experience of all sorts of things. Do you think that was helpful? I do think that was very helpful. I, I, I do think that a lot of young people, you know, aim for the music business or to go into acting or whatever and 
don't have any other skills. There are some kids out there who go out and get another skill before they go in for what they're dreaming of. Um, I don't think you should just go into something like this and think this is the, the beginning and the end of everything. I, I do think you should always have something you can fall back on and try to live your life, you know, a little bit longer than most of the young kids that are going in for the fame. Because it is just about fame to a lot of the young kids. Some of them genuinely have a fantastic talent, but I think they go in too young at, 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 at mm. times, and, and when they're knocked, they can't kind of get themselves back up. But there are kids who can get themselves back up. So I do think you should have something else to fall back on. No doubt about that. How was it for you living in the house with all these kids? Because you have to live in the house with them, didn't you? I did. Do you know what? Every single one of those kids, from, from One Direction to even down to Cher Lloyd and Katie we, we, Ways, or like I never said that girl's name, and I'm very fond of her, I, they gave me nothing but respect. I cannot say that, say they did anything else. I had the height of respect from them. They would keep the noise down when they knew I was in bed because I was the mummy of the house, really. And then Louis would often take me out of the house to give me just a break and put me into the hotel that he was staying in and give me a room to myself just to give me a break away from it. So I was, I was so looked after, it was unbelievable. What about the people who were on with you? Who won when you were on? That was Matt Cardle. Because Matt Cardle, uh, I know Matt, he's a, he's a really nice chap. He's a great bloke. obviously One Direction were on too, and they're the ones who had the huge career. Well, do you know something about One Direction? I mean, I was good friends with all the lads on that, every one of them. And they worked really hard. And when we seen them working so hard, we knew that Simon was, you know, really pushing it for them. Simon was behind them 120%. And the lads wanted it badly. And they knew once they had him behind them, they were going to make something. None of us, not even Simon, could have, you know, began to believe how big they would have went. But I can't emphasize it enough. I am so proud of them, and I think they deserve everything they've got. I just hope that they, they know none of this is for life, and that they, they've they taken the advice I gave them, like to invest in stuff and, and, and keep some money aside and not be foolish. I hope they've done that, because... They are nice guys, and they work blooming hard all the way through that show. We all did, but when, when Simon took them on board, he made them work even harder. Do you work quite a lot now, Mary, yourself? I do. I work very hard at the moment, and I love it. I've just finished doing my own show in the Olympia there in, in Dublin, and, the, and my new album's coming out. Um, it's, it's all the old black-and-white movie uh, songs from that. <laughs> and I'm hoping to get back to the UK to, to release it with the help of Tesco's and to do a few shows around Scotland and Manchester and Liverpool. They're the places we've been in touch with at the moment. And do you still live in Ireland? I still live in Ireland. I still live in the same house with my daughter. And I still go to my family every weekend, and we have dinner, and I still go out with my friends to the local pubs. I I mean, I'm too old for the big fancy stuff. I Mm. go to the fancy stuff if I'm invited. But it's not really my scene. My scene is at home with friends and family and enjoying what God has given me and what Simon Cowell and Louis Walsh gave me the chance to do. Still in touch with Louis? I'm still in touch with Louis. Louis has been, Louis has been 100% behind me since I left The X Factor. There's no doubt about that. I've only got to, to give him a text or ring him and he's there giving me advice. Well, will you say uh, hi from me when you talk to him next? I will definitely say hello to him for you, no problem. I know you as well. I've heard of you as well. <laughs> That's because I've been around man. a long, well, long man, I don't time. Know. <laughs> I didn't mean that in a bad way. You know what I mean. <laughs> Mary, uh, off your new album, uh, if we were to play one track, what track would you want us to play? There, listen, there's two tracks. I've written a song on this album, which I never in my life thought I could do. And the song is called Midnight Dreamer. And it's my own words. It's very simple. But it's just the way I felt many years ago about a certain lover. And if I could get you to play that one, I'd be very happy. Mary, nice to talk to you. Uh, Have a a great year. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. I hope to see you soon. You are listening to James and Rob on the James Well Radio Show. Great. I think she was a lovely lady. If we can get Louis Walsh on a show in the future, I think that would be great. And the album is called Magic of the Musicals, and it is available uh, from iTunes, from Mary's website at uh, maryburnofficial.com. 
uh, from next month. It will be available in all good stores throughout the UK. But if you want to get there first, then all you've got to do is uh, go to Mary's website, maryburnofficial.com. Now, as I said a little while ago on the pro... Rob, what are you doing now? I'm, I'm flicking through the notes. Well, would you not? Sorry. I mean, I could hear that in my headphones. I'm, I'm sorry. OK, if you're just joining us, this is the James Well Radio Show uh, coming to you via your favourite radio station or from our friends at uh, talentgb.com. Talentgb.com, of course, who provide us with some of the guests on the programme. And if you are an artist and you would like to get some publicity for your act, whatever that may be, check out talentgb.com. It is an amazing website where, of course, you can uh, promote your wares. Go and check them out. Uh, now, same-sex marriage. Uh, I don't have a problem, do you? I don't have a problem, other than that I want to turn the page. And I'm going to make a noise, and you're going to say, what are you doing? And I feel like a kid that's trying to sneakily turn the page over. Can I turn the page over, please? Turn the page over. Thank you. You've got your notes. Are you ready? I'm ready now. OK, so these are some of your thoughts on, um, uh, on same-sex marriage. Uh, Mr. Max Chair, hi Max, uh, says, uh, God created man in his own image. So presumably, if God creates gay men, then he himself must be gay. It's an interesting way of looking at it. Yeah, uh, and, and I, I, there's no argument from me. Uh, James says, depends if you're religious or not. I'm not, so I do not care who thinks what. Technically, Adam and Eve were not the first. <laughs> the Big Bang created life, not a god. Why should anyone be against anything if they are law-abiding citizens? Interesting point. Of course, uh, we could talk about the Big Bang. No, perhaps we won't. Uh, Joe says, Joe Madigan says, congratulations to the new law. We love who we love, regardless of of religious beliefs. I think that's uh, absolutely right. Wayne T. Goulding says, I don't agree. I don't agree uh, to same sex. Full stop. That's it. But I wouldn't make anybody uncomfortable in my company either. It's their business and my opinion. That's all. Interesting way of looking at it, Wayne. Good. Uh, Michael Penny uh, says, I definitely welcome it, but I wouldn't say I'm going to celebrate it. It feels a tad strange. Me celebrating the fact that now I feel I have equal rights as opposed to feeling like something of a second-class citizen, outcast. Should religions be able to discriminate? Hmm, I don't honestly believe so, but I am sure there will be many establishments that try. The truth of the matter, though, in that case, is that if they're so fiercely against same-sex relationships, I'm not sure any of us would want to marry in those places anyway. Um, it's an interesting point. You know, a lot of people uh, who are discriminated against by religion still seem to want to get married in a religious building. Well, let's face it, actually, when you think about it, religious buildings are really pretty, uh, very attractive places. And when you get married and you decide you want to uh, sign up to a long-term relationship and you want to have some sort of celebration, much nicer... Uh, to go to a very uh, attractive place, uh, somewhere that makes you feel good, rather than a kind of, um, I don't know, an atmosphere-less office in an office building, I kind of a registry office. So much better that you can go and get married somewhere. Why shouldn't people be able to get married in an attractive place like that? Uh, Matthew Williams says, religions should be banned, as should marriage. You tell him, Matthew. Uh, and Kevin uh, Whalen says, uh, these religious nuts need to watch the Discovery Channel. It's all about nature and not some imaginary person in the clouds. And Paul Bexfield finally says, I love my friends, gay, straight, bi, black, white, for who they are, not for who they sleep with. Everyone deserves happiness, so though it's took a long time to happen. I welcome it. So some of your thoughts, and uh, that's, that's pretty good. I think that's a very good way of looking at it. So, we're not getting married, Rob. I'm already married. That would make me oh, a, yeah. a bigger yeah, miss, yeah, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, of course, some... some uh, and that's all got to do with the religion as well, hasn't it? That's true, yeah. 
you know, some religions say you can have more than one one wife or husband. Well, I don't know. Is there any religion where a woman can have more than one husband? Maybe you could have one of each. Yeah. What do you mean one of each? Oh, oh, I see what you mean. You can have a husband and you can have a husband. Or you can have a wife and you can have a wife. <laughs> sort of. Or you could have a husband and a wife or a wife and a husband. That's Depending right. on who you were and what you wanted. That's the one I was going for. Was it? Yeah. Yeah. I think... Uh, obviously, I think it's been a long day. I think it's probably time to go. Uh, you're listening to the James Well Radio Show online and on your favourite radio station, wherever that may be. Uh, now, what about the teacher strike? That's a bit of a blow for people uh, last week. I don't know how it affected you. I don't know whether or not you think uh, it's a good idea. Over 300 people got in touch with us about the teacher strike this week. Uh, and... Uh, a quick, um, a, a quick straw poll said most people didn't agree with it. Uh, Tom Flood says, I just think with inset days, those are days that teachers seem to have where they don't want any pupils around, and the holidays they get, they're not going to gain much support. I just don't think that striking is the answer. Uh, Jamie Law says... Those of you moaning about how much teachers get paid and how many luxury holidays they have, uh, they get go to university and get a teaching qualification. Then, then you too can benefit. Makes me laugh. And Karen Pickle says, as an ex-teacher, I found the job was fine. Good pay. Gave up when my son was born. Um, and John Leslie Gammon says, teachers, firefighters and nurses should be well looked after. But I'm against the strike action. Just never solves anything. Should have never got to this. You know, that is a really good point. Um, I was trying to think, when was the last, uh, you'll all say the poll, the poll strike, the um, poll tax strike uh, action was the last thing that changed politicians' mind, and that wasn't really a strike. When did the last strike actually win anything for workers? Can anyone tell me? Get in touch, and we'll talk about it on next week's show. Because um, even, even thinking about the miners' strike, and it's 30 years since the miners' strike, the, the miners' strike never, ever achieved anything except to get all the mines closed down. So when did a, a strike last achieve anything? And if you're a teacher and you uh, want to have your say, uh, then feel free, get in touch with me. Of course, uh, jameswhaleradio at gmail.com is where you can find us. Or Facebook me or tweet me. It's easy. James Whale Radio Show. You can tweet us there. You can tweet me on my own personal uh, Twitter site at the James Whale 2 which is, of course... Uh, during the time that I'm not on the air on this program, you can always get in touch. It's like a little, a little, um, a little written radio program, isn't it? If that's what you think, yes, yes, yes. You're awake then. Yeah, I was just thinking about my daughter because she's at home today because they're striking in our school today. Oh dear, oh dear. <laughs> yeah, and, and had you not got somebody who could look after her, you wouldn't be here doing the show, would you? That's true. Very true. Mm. Uh, Steve Carter says, I work in retail. It's got unsociable hours, crap pay, nowhere near a teacher's. Uh, the private sector, no guaranteed pension, unreasonable targets, stupid, pointless paperwork. Sound familiar? <laughs> oh, dear. Isn't there anybody who enjoys their work out there? Well, we sort of do, don't we? Yeah. Yeah, we enjoy it. Yeah. Except, you know, when the f signal goes down because you haven't paid the... Uh, electricity bill or whatever uh karen pullen hello karen says uh, we are all ignored and undervalued get a grip get a job in the real world if you don't like the teaching job you have and patricia clegg says many years ago i worked in several local schools and i saw firsthand how hard it can be eventually i ended up working with special needs children the dedication and hard work from the teachers i worked with was without doubt, worthy of the wages uh, they earn. The only thing with striking is the disruption for parents trying to find alternative care. If they work, must be very difficult. Thank you, everybody. Uh, lots of people who got in touch. We haven't got time to read them all out, but thank you very much indeed. And if you want to, at any time, get in touch with the program, as I say, just uh, either Facebook us, uh, tweet us or uh, email me jameswhaleradio at gmail.com with your thoughts and suggestions for guests you might like 
to see on the programme. Uh, now, let's talk to uh, a man who has probably had more success than, uh, than anyone I know in a number of careers. Uh, politician, author, bon viveur. Uh, Lord Geoffrey Archer joins the programme now. Geoffrey, thank you for coming on the programme. How are you? I'm very well indeed. I thought you were going to say auctioneer as I did an auction for you. I was going to get to that, actually. I will get to that in a minute. That's going to be my end bit now, Geoffrey. I, I always thought you would make a very good broadcaster. You haven't done that. Why not? No, I, I'm fascinated by uh, broadcasting. I'm fascinated by the medium. It's a wonderful medium. Uh, but I'm afraid I've done so many other things and enjoyed so many other things and had such a privileged life that, uh, well, you well know, James, you can't do everything. I actually always wanted to be the captain of the England cricket team, and they just keep missing me. And <laughs> my dearest friends are now telling me it's too late, which is, you know, there you are. It's the way you're treated by some people. <laughs> now, which, 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 but just remind me, because of the, the prolific nature of writing, you are at the moment, and we're very lucky to get you, because you are away writing your latest book. Which one is this? Well, I'm doing a series called The Clifton Chronicles, the story of yeah. Harry Clifton, a boy born in the back streets of Bristol to a docker, his, his father. And he falls in love with Emma Barrington, and Sir James Barrington owns the docks. So that's, and I've decided to do a seven part series. And the book that's currently number one on the Sunday Times is the fourth book. And I'm out here in Mallorca at the moment in the middle of writing the fifth book. Oh, what a life, Geoffrey, what a life. Um, Mallorca, of course, that's, that, that's the island that um, Don Quixote was based on, isn't it? Indeed it is, and it's, it's a lovely island and uh, beautiful weather. It's, it's got everything for a writer because you can relax and get on with the job and not have terrible people like James Whale, that man from the BBC <laughs> ringing you. <laughs> And you can get on with your work. It's just wonderful. Is, uh, is the current book uh, based on, on fact uh, somebody that you knew in Bristol, or is it a complete fiction? It is fiction in the sense that uh, that's what it's on the shelves as. But Harry Clifton is very much based on my life as a young man. Of course, I am a West Countryman. I come from Western Supermare, and I am a West Countryman, and I know that part of the world. So when I decided where to put my hero and heroine in this particular series of books. I chose the West Country because I spent the first 18 years of my life there. When you were a young man, what did you want to do? Well, my mother had been a politician and a woman of tremendous energy, also a writer, actually. Uh, so first and foremost, I wanted to be a politician and indeed entered the House at the age of 29, had five years in the House, and almost went bankrupt after a very foolish investment and wrote my first book, Not a Penny More, Not a Penny Less. So I went from being a politician to almost by mistake becoming a writer. Do you, do you actually think that if, if life had, had turned differently for you, you would be possibly or have been prime minister? Uh, was that an ambition that you ever had in later life? Well, I, had, I, I entered the house at 29, so clearly I was ambitious, and it would be foolish to deny otherwise. But if you are saying, I suspect, after all those years, I'd have ended up as Minister, minister of State for Transport. <laughs> if you're asking, <laughs> would I swap that for having sold 270 million books? No, James, I wouldn't. 270 million? Mm. That's amazing. Did you ever think that you'd be uh, an author of such repute? Well, no, to begin with, because the first book, Not a Penny More, Not a Penny Less, sold 3,000 copies. And I now keep reading in the press that it was an instant success. It was not. It was Cain and Abel that took off and sold a million in the first week. That was where the big change came and life changed. Now, it is true they went back. The readers went back and bought Not a Penny More, Not a Penny Less. And it's, it, it also sold millions. But that, that was five years down the line before that happened. I was literally, at the time, living off my wife. I didn't have a job. And she kept saying, are you going to get a real job? Uh, and I kept saying, I think the writing will, will happen. Did there come a time when you knew you'd written a book and you knew 
that it was going to be a huge success? When you don't, you know, you sit there being told and you get very, very nervous. I did know that Cain and Abel had been auctioned in the United States and Simon and Schuster had paid 3200000 for it. So I had a feeling that they believed it was going to be a success. But the selling of a million copies in Britain in the first week, no, you can't be prepared for that. It just... You, you just sit there not believing it. And, you know, even years later, you don't believe it. It's, it's amazing. Do you think somebody who's not well-known could have that success as a writer? I always answer that question in the same way, James. In my young life, uh, I watched two books come out on the, in the same week. One by Bob Hope, who was one of the best-known people on earth and one by David Niven, who was very well-known, but certainly not in the United States well-known. And Bob Hope's book sold 7 million worldwide, and The Moon's a Balloon by David Niven sold 27 million. So the answer is it's quite useful to be well-known, but in the end, it's the book that matters, and Mr. Niven proved it beyond all of us. Now you're sitting working on the latest in, in the series of books you're doing at the moment. Do, do you ever get a, a, a sort of a, a block? We hear about writer's block. But do you, do you sit there and think, oh, my golly, I've promised this book. I've got to have it done in a couple of days. Yeah, I just can't think where the story's going. That hasn't been a problem yet after 37 years. In fact, I've named my home in Mallorca writer's block. But to date, that hasn't happened. And indeed, like you, I keep hearing about it and other people tell me about it. I think I'm a natural storyteller, and therefore, it's a lucky gift. But you're quite right. Tomorrow morning, I might wake up and say, hell, where am I going? Do you ever get that thing when the, the storyline comes into your mind, you're out having dinner in the evening, or you're sitting there having a glass of wine, and then suddenly, uh, a chapter comes into your mind that you rather wasn't there? No, you're more likely to think of a chapter that will be better. I, I had the ending of the next book all planned out in my mind. I thought I'd got a wonderful ending. And then when I actually got to it and started writing, the pen took me in a totally different direction with a totally different ending. So that can happen. The other thing that happens, you say when you're out to dinner, can that sort of thing happen, James? Sometimes a word. Yesterday I was wrestling over a word, the word heritage and the word parentage and I couldn't make up my mind I actually went to bed worrying about which word worked better the sentence was clearly she was telling the truth about her parentage or heritage and so you sometimes even be down to one word that you're worrying about which word did you go for I went I went I'm actually heritage is in the book and I'm going to to I think make it that was already in. I think I'm going to make it parentage. It's still worrying you. Uh, still, I get you get that all the time. Actually, you get you think I can make that sharper. I can make that better. I can make the reader turn the page quicker. So yes, you're doing that all the time, which is actually why I escape away to Mallorca, uh, because there it's so peaceful. One can think, 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 think. Right, right, right. The interesting thing, of course, is people said books would, would become a thing of the past. People wouldn't read in the future. But it's getting, it, it's actually more so now, isn't it, with, with uh, sort of electronic books, Kindles, uh, tablets. More and more people are reading that perhaps didn't read before. I think that is true. And the, the shock for me was five years ago, uh, my advisors at Macmillan said 5% uh, of people are now reading you are on ebook, um, And... They said to me, in five years' time, Jeffrey, it, it'll be 50%. And I must say, I, I huffed and puffed and didn't believe that. And sitting here today, that is exactly right. 50% of my books are being read on one form or another of ebook, and 50% people are actually buying a real book. Have you done an audio book yet? All of them. Are, every, every single book I've done has been an audio book, and I've had the great privilege of having some uh, wonderful, wonderful people reading the books, because it's very important not just to uh, have an audio uh, book, but to, uh, to have, be confident with the person who's reading it. So, yes, all the Clifton Chronicles 
uh, are in audio and all the other books. Cain and Abel's in audio, Mother Penny Moore's in audio. Have you never done one yourself? I've been asked by my publishers to do one. The problem is time. You very kindly said at the end, wouldn't you enjoy having being a broadcaster? The truth is everything's time. And if you're going to read a 120,000-word book, that's going to take a, a month out of your life. Uh, and so and in any case, I rather like having a, a famous actor or actress uh, on there doing it for you. Well, just remember, when, when they haven't got the time... Jeffrey, I'm always available. You're available, James. Oh, to do any of your books, Jeffrey, absolutely. <laughs> tell me, tell me about politics today. Do you think politics today has changed out of all recognition from when you were more closely involved? Well, I have a great deal of sympathy for people in politics. Now I'm sitting on the outside watching. When people decide to give service and do a job for which they will be paid far less than they could if they'd not done politics. And that applies to all three of our leaders at the moment. That applies to David Cameron, Nick Clegg, and Ed Miliband. They could have all made a lot more money doing something else. The one that gets me really cross is the automatic criticism of someone who's been to Eton and Oxford and wants to be prime minister. If we've reached a stage in our country, James, where we can't relax enough in our skins to take someone who's had a good education, that's a terrible situation. And I have to remind people, and I'd say it if it was Ed Miliband, I have to remind people that Mr. Cameron got a first-class honours degree. So he's a fairly bright individual, and he should not be condemned for that. If they feel he's doing a bad job, that's one thing. But they should not be criticising uh, the education he had. Do you think uh, somebody could rise, if you like, and, and it might even be a plot for a book, of course, do you think somebody could, could rise from a very ordinary background, come from a very ordinary family, and I know Margaret Thatcher came from a family of a grocer and everything else, um, but do you still think there is the possibility that somebody who perhaps didn't have a university education uh, could get into politics, get into government in this country still? There are always weird exceptions, and they're often great men and great women, who the rules don't apply to. And we've seen it in the last 30 or 40 years because we've seen John Major become prime minister of our country. And he'd be the first to tell you that he did not have a formal education. His education, of course, started, one might say, after he left school, when, when that remarkable brain of his uh, became attuned to the world of politics. And indeed, he did become prime minister. Winston Churchill never went to university and is rated as one of the great prime ministers we've ever produced. So yes, if you're saying, can it be done today? Even more so, I would say it was possible today that a truly bright 17 or 18 year old who suddenly decided they wanted to go into politics. Yes, if they went, if, if there's no reason they shouldn't be educated between the age of 18 and, uh, and later. Indeed, in my own case, uh, James, I actually have written in who's who, uh, educated by my wife, since leaving Wellington School, Somerset, and Brasenose College, Oxford. <laughs> you mentioned the word service, Geoffrey, and I think that's a very important word in politics, and I think sometimes people go into politics and they call it their career, which is fine, but they don't actually seem to realise that politics is a, fo it's a service, it's a service industry to look after the people of the country. Yes, and if you don't feel that way, you shouldn't be in it. I mean, for me, the fun was the people. There are some people in politics. The fun is the red boxes. That's fine. God knows we've got to have people who are capable of doing that. But for me, the most fun was on the ground, listening to what people had to say and going and fighting and not very often winning. Uh, it's a great battle trying to pull off the, even a minor uh, achievement. But that, I, that for me was always the, uh, the fun which is perhaps why I loved election campaigns. They were always, for me, the three weeks I enjoyed most in politics. And, and working both for Margaret Thatcher and John Major over five election campaigns, 
uh, was perhaps the most fun I ever had. I like Prime Minister's question times because I think it tells you a lot about people. But lots of politicians always say, oh, well, we'd right, like to get rid of this. This doesn't actually show us at our best. What do you think about PMQs? Well, it's changed a lot since I left the House. And, uh, of course, we don't, we, we, no one listens to us in, in the House of Lords in that way. The Prime Minister's questions is quite rightly the, the centre of uh, question time. When I was in the, the lower house as a child, I entered the house at 29, there was no radio or television. And I think the standard of debate was higher for one simple reason. No one was interested in a soundbite. No one was interested in delivering one sentence that they hoped would capture a headline the next day. Speeches were much better considered. I've never forgotten Selwyn Lloyd standing up and answering the question in the following way. Now, what I'm about to say, not only did I witness, James, but mm. if it was done today, the press would say, terrible. Mr. Selwyn Lloyd stood at the dispatch box and said, I haven't considered that. I will, and I will come back to the honorable gentleman, which was common sense. In other words, he didn't know the answer, but he was willing to look into it. Nowadays, you're meant to know everything about everything and have an instant reply. Nobody's that bright. And so sometimes you get, I'm afraid, some rather silly replies. So I know I'm getting old and boring and dull, <laughs> but I liked the days when there was no radio and television in the House of Commons. You're not getting old or boring, Geoffrey. Don't <laughs> let anybody tell you that. <laughs> tell me this. If, you, if, if you're a young politician... Who do you show most allegiance to? Your constituents who voted you in or the leader of your party? Well, it's neither, really. When you say the leader of your party, of course, he's, he or she, very, very important. It's, it's whether you, whether it's the people on the ground or the party. Now, there's two very honest and fair answers to that, James. You first and foremost represent your constituency and should be telling those people in the House what they are thinking. But there will be bills you agree with, and there will be bills you don't agree with. And if we didn't have a whipping system, you'd never get anything through the House of Commons. Now, I believe you should vote against something if you feel, definitely feel, there's a moral issue involved and you can't vote that way. That's fine. I accept that totally. But you can't be doing that every week. Otherwise, you're not in the party. You're outside the party. So your allegiance to the party should not be underestimated. And people on the street, people outside sometimes feel, oh, well, they, they all gang together. It's not true. You've got to govern. You've got to make the country move forward. So sometimes you have to say, well, I feel that way. But the majority, the vast majority of my colleagues do not. And therefore, I will either abstain or go along with them. And they'll, they'll admire you more for that, so that when you really stand for something firmly, I remember as a child, I say I was a child of 29, I stood very firmly on museum charges. I disapproved of children being charged to go into an art gallery. And, and I let my conservative friend know in no uncertain terms but that was the only issue during that parliament that I voted against my party. Because many of the other issues I would have felt strongly on or not been quite sure, but realized if you're going to govern, you've actually got to get bills through the House. Let's talk finally about your charitable works, of which you do many. I've spent a fascinating evening with you for my own charity and for others, uh, where you have raised Hundreds of thousands of pounds sometimes. Actually, how much money have you raised for charity? In my lifetime, 41 million as an auctioneer. In the last uh, <laughs> sort of 10 years, I think it's 21 million. That's a heck of a lot. Don't let's kid ourselves, James. Some people, I mean, I actually enjoy being an auctioneer and get a lot of fun uh, in raising the money for different charities. Uh, so, yes, it is, uh, it's quite demanding and it's quite tough, but I do enjoy it. It's my hobby.
Well, I have to say that you are one of the funniest entertainers I've ever seen. Don't take this the wrong way. And for anybody who ever gets invited to a charitable event where Jeffrey is uh, is doing the charity auction at the end, it is more, as far as I'm concerned, it's more like a, a, an evening of stand-up comedy than anything else. Well, you've got to prize the money out of their wallets. You've somehow got to get the money out, and that isn't always easy. Your charity was fun because they'd all come because they were friends of yours. They're, I was full of people who I knew, and they were friends of yours, and one could have a real go at you and a real go at the people in the audience. <laughs> Sometimes I get very flat evenings, James, when they just sit and look at me and they don't pay up anything. <laughs> I, I have seen you demoralize people who thought they were quite clever and people who've interrupted you, you who you've automatically fined 50 or 100 pounds on the spot Certainly. and they've had to pay up. Certainly. The charity gets the money quite right. <laughs> uh, Jeffrey, I'm I'm over the time that I was allotted to talk to you because uh, your, your assistant said, now, Jeffrey has to get back to work. Don't keep him too long. The day job. Yes, back to the day job. So thank you very much indeed. And uh, when you get back over this side, uh, perhaps we can share a drink. That would be lovely, James. Thank you very much and good luck with the programme. Lord Archer, thank you. Bye. Ah, so there we are, Geoffrey Archer. Thank you, Geoffrey. And just a reminder, of course, uh, another advert coming up. No, don't stick your fingers in your ears, because here on the James Whale Radio Show, we want to offer you the chance uh, to get a copy of a book absolutely free, an audio book. An audio book, free. It could be one of Jeffrey Archer's. It could be my humble offering, almost a celebrity, or another book that I have uh, voiced, not one of Jeffrey's, but I'm hoping he took the hint, The Butterfly Boy. All you need to go to do is this. Just do this. Check out our Audible logo on the website. Have you see that? Right. Click on that. Click on the Audible bit on jameswellradio.co.uk. Go to that. Follow the links. Good. And uh, get a book free. Maybe one of Jeffrey Archer's. Who knows? Uh, and also, talking about adverts, have you checked out our new shop? Because not only can you get a signed copy of Almost a Celebrity, signed by me for a mere six ninety five. dollars uh, you can get other stuff as well. Others, loads of stuff. Uh, but there are no kitchen sinks at the moment available. Uh, so, uh, go, to the, <laughs> go to the website, jameswellradio.co.uk forward slash shop, and there's all sorts of stuff you can get there. Uh, right, that's almost it, isn't it? Yeah, 270 million books he sold. I know. Uh, just if he got a quid for each book, and he may well have got a pound for each book, gives you some idea how wealthy he is. Well, we've only sold a couple of dozen on our website of ours. Have we? Yeah. Well, we're not trying... Listen, go to the website and buy my book, because I've signed thousands. <laughs> have you? What? I've signed thousands, yeah. No, I've signed, a f I've signed about 50. Limited. Limited edition. Go on there, and uh, and you can get a copy of... Because it's nice to have, you know, you could get the audio version as well and listen to that, or you can, you can get the... Uh, you can get on Kindle and stuff like that. But if you, if you go and get one of my paperbacks, you can keep it. Put it on the bookshelf. Can, yeah, you can look at the pictures. So it's limited edition, then, until it's, you yeah. find some more. Yeah, yeah. So be quick. Uh, anyway, I think that's it, really, because we're right over time. So thank you to uh, our friends at your favourite local radio station online, our good friends at talentgb.com. And if you are an artiste, uh, check out that website as well. If you want to get in touch with the show, how do they do it? They can either email us at jameswellradio at gmail.com or go to facebook.com forward slash jameswellradio. Very good, Robbo. Um, I'll see you same time next week then, mate. Okie dokie. Toodaloo. You going to the where? Toodaloo, I said. That's what I thought you said. Not to the loo, toodaloo. It's a term of, oh, for goodness sake. See you next time. Bye. James Well, the voice of reason on the James Well radio show. You're listening to the James Well radio show. For more information, visit www.jameswhaleradio.co.uk. Why not check us out on facebook.com slash jameswhaleradioshow or follow James on Twitter at the James Whale.
James Whale, the voice of reason.